G'day guys, welcome to the Process of Success podcast. This is episode six. I'm here with Australian and Western Australian cricketer Hilton Cartwright. Hilts, thanks for joining me. Thanks mate, thanks for having me. Now for those of you who might not know Hilton, um, some of you international listeners or viewers, Hilton's played two tests and two one day internationals for Australia. 33 first class games um, with an average of nearly 44, 34 list day matches and 27 T20 matches. So he's, uh, he's a very experienced cricketer and one who no doubt will play a lot more for Australia in the future. Hilts to start, I like to take our guests back to their childhood. Um, you've got quite a unique story being born and, and spending your first part of your life in Zimbabwe. Um, what was that like? What was that like and what's your earliest memory of playing cricket? So my, my number on the back of my shirt is my earliest memory of cricket and it sort of goes with my playing style um, in a sense that that's the first innings that I hit a six in and that's the first innings I remember just because I hit a six and I got out next ball trying to do the same thing. So <laughs> I made 35 and um, I was on 29, hit a six because you get retired at 30 um, and then I tried to do it again to get into 40 because it was like the, ex- the elusive 40 club. Um, and I got our next ball, so that's that's my earliest memory. Um, was that in Zimbabwe or in Australia? Yeah, yeah, that was in Zimbabwe. That yep. was the first time I can ever remember playing cricket. Um, and for me, I remember when when we grew up, it was a little bit different over there. You grew up playing on um, turf pitches from the get go, uh, whereas over here you play a lot on astro turf, and then you go through districts and start playing on turf wickets. But um, it was literally my whole class would all the guys in the class would play cricket in, in the summer, and then in the winter time we'd all play rugby together so I was always playing with my friends and that didn't really change over the course of my career really. What So what sort of age was that when you in your first game and hitting that six? I was in grade, I was in year two so I would have been seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. seven, yeah, so year two. It was, a, it was a small ground, I'm not gonna say I had like 50 metre boundaries or anything but um, I've gone on to like Google Maps and seen how big the actual ground was, and I think the boundary is about 30 metres, so I was, I'm still pretty happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. What shot was it? Uh, can I dress it up a little bit? Yeah, of course. It was a lovely straight drive over wide mid on, <laughs> aka cow corner. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Good memory. What a memory to, um, yeah, to go back to. I remember my first game, I hit a four first ball, and that's a memory that stuck with me throughout my life. Um, so then you moved to Australia at 11 with your family. How was that transition? What was that like leaving where you, what you knew and where you'd grown up at that age? Uh, it, was, it was definitely tough um, just because what, when we the initial movement was really tough because I was leaving all my friends, seemed like the end of the world. Um, but I actually found going to Wesley quite easy because I could just go straight into sport, wouldn't really talk to anyone during the day and then as soon as I started playing cricket, they all just, I just started getting friends and all of a sudden a week in I had three best friends. Um, so I actually found that transition very easy in the sense of making new friends. But at the time I absolutely hated leaving all my friends, leaving our farm. Um, but in the end I'm, I'm still good mates with some of those guys now. And so that was cricket that brought you your friendships at that age? Yeah, cricket. Uh, I started playing hockey when I first moved over here just because one of the guys I played cricket with, he played hockey, so I was like, oh, I'll just take up hockey for a couple of years, and yeah, yeah next thing you knew, we were good friends. Awesome, awesome. And in that period where you're sort of 11, 12, and beyond, how often were you tra- training and playing? Oh, my mum hated me for the cricket season because I'd just about train every single day, um, and then I'd play Friday for school, Saturday for club, and then play Sunday for club. So I was basically training every day of the week, and I'd play three games a week as well. Awesome, awesome. That's what most kids should be doing at that age, I reckon, if they love it. And what sort of um, age did you start to get one-on-one coaching? Was that something that you did at that age or was it a bit later on? Um, it's a good question because I remember I got a little bit of one-on-one coaching from Wayne Andrews because he was the first 11 coach at Wesley when I was in about year eight, year nine. Um, so I just sort of, I'd bum around the nets out the back when all the first team was training. Um, and then at the end he would give me some throwdowns and give me a few tips and I'd go down to Newlands and get a few tips from him then. So that was my first one-on-one coach. Um, but then I didn't have one for probably another f- three or four years until Jeff Marsh took over the, the first 11 role at, at Wesley. And then now he's, he's still my go-to coach now at the Wacker. He'll, I'll have hits and I'll basically choose him or, or JL. But they're the guys who've known my game for the longest and if I'm ever unsure about it, 
a theory or, or anything like that, I always go back to them to talk about it and, and have a hit afterwards as well. Awesome. That was going to be one of my next questions about your mentors, um, Swampy and, and JL and, and Wayne. Is there anyone else outside of cricket you've gone to or are they mainly the guys you, you go back to? They're, they're the main guys now and they've always been in the background. But when I was younger, I had a um, the South Perth first grade coach at the time, Lawrence Sprigg. He was probably my... Um, Really, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be on the track I'm on now because I, I went over to the UK and, and played a bit of cricket over there, came back and wasn't sure if I wanted to play cricket anymore. Um, and he sort of um, guided me in the way that I needed to be, sort of the, the path I needed to go on. I sort of went to South Perth training, wasn't sure if I wanted to do it, and he just kind of kept kept me positive, um, kept my energy levels up, and he's probably the guy that I, I, I've thanked the most because he got me on the pathway of cricket and and sort of taught me life lessons outside of cricket and how to keep a healthy balance. Awesome, awesome. Having good people is so important, especially when you're quite young. Now, you mentioned um, Wesley. Obviously, Mitch Marsh is a big sort of name from Wesley. Was he in your age group? Was he a bit older? Or? He, was, he was a year older than me, so I played a lot of cricket with him um, through juniors. When, I was, when Jeff was our coach, I'd go to their, their place because they had a net, net out the back of their house, so I'd have hits at, the, as hit, at his place. Um, so watching him was... He was almost like my hero in a way because, mate, he would smack him that far. It was ridiculous. He'd, there's this, um, the I guess you can call it the pavilion at Wesley. He would be hitting him over the gym, which is probably a, a 70 to 80 metre hit for a year 10 kid, and he was clearing it with ease. So just seeing him at that young age, you could see he had the talent, and then to sort of aspire to that at a young age always sort of had something to to have a, a goal towards. Awesome, and measure yourself against, I suppose. Yeah. And it must be nice now to have played a lot of first-class cricket together and, and see him, or both of your careers, careers progress to international cricket. Yeah, I remember seeing when Mitch played his first game for WA, I think he was 17, he got 70 on the first dig on a green seamer. And a lot of people saying, oh, how good this kid is, he's going to be awesome. I was like, I could have told you that four years ago from Wesley when he was banging him over the fence at, um, at school. So to grow up with him and... He's actually a really good teacher as well. Um, he shares a lot of his knowledge that he has because he's obviously played a lot of international cricket. Um, when he comes back to the guys, he really shares that with us and, and helps us learn in a really fun way. And he's just a really good people's person. He gets people, he's, he's good at social um, social interaction, so he's always awesome to, to learn off. Excellent, and it must have been a bit of a hitting contest between the two of you, with you hitting a few bombs at the other end. <laughs> I'll try, and I'll just like just be clearing the rope at one end, and he's like sending him into the tennis courts at Wesley, so I'd like to think I was keeping up with him, but looking back, I probably wasn't. Well, these days you probably do. I remember you hitting me for a couple of big bombs down the road at South Perth a couple of years ago into the top of the trees, but we won't go there. Um, so when you moved over and you were playing at Wesley, did you play in the WA underage pathways, the 17s and the 19s? Yes, I played in the under 15s um, state team and then snuck my way into the under 17s team, but I didn't. I wasn't good enough in the under 19s team to, to make the cut. Uh, I remember we had, a, we had a really good team that year, um, but I remember being gutted. I thought my career was over. I couldn't believe that I hadn't made a, a state team, but I think what I learned from that was if you don't make a certain team, that's just going to happen throughout your whole career, whether it's cricket, whether it's anything. If you, if you don't make a cut in one scenario, it doesn't mean to say you can't do that in the, in the near future. So I think that taught me a really valuable lesson. But at the time, I thought my whole life was over, cricket was. Yeah, that's such a, a valuable thing to hear, I think. And, and for all of our listeners and viewers, we've got a lot of young guys that one of the most common questions we get is, I, I've missed out on selection or I'm really disappointed I haven't made it or someone else made it and I should have. And it must be so nice for them to hear a story like that of someone who's gone on to play test cricket who did miss out on, on that selection. So great insight. And guys, for you you guys and girls listening, it's not the be-all and end-all if you're not making underage rep, rep sides because you can forge your own path without that. Now, moving forward, you've mentioned your time at South Perth and Lawn Sprigg and the influence he had, but how did you come about to making your first grade debut? Was that on the back of some really strong sort of second and third grade performances or were you sort of fast-tracked as a lot of good juniors do based on your potential and where everyone saw you you're getting to? So my my first grade debut was a one-day game against Mount Lawley and um, it was the last game of the school holidays before I had to go back to Wesley so I think they, they sort of threw me in the deep end and gave me that opportunity um, but the, the game I sort of really remember was when um, the following year we played I played two or three second living uh, second grade games and made a few runs in those. So that way, I, I felt like I'd earned my call up. Whereas when I just sort of got given the opportunity right at the end of the year, 
um, just felt like it was just on a bit of a silver platter and it didn't didn't mean as much. But when I came sort of through second grade and, and made a few runs that way, I really felt like I'd earned my spot in the team. And, and then I think that translated into my performance. I got a few runs that game and just made me feel a bit more confident, like I sort of deserved it in a way. Yeah. Even though that should have been there when I played the, the first game, it's just my own self-belief knew that I, I was good enough. And what happened in the first game? How'd you go? I got 30 odd, but I think I got 30 off about 60 balls in a one day. So I, I blocked the crap out of them, but I, tr- I, I really tried. And I think the whole time there was always that self-doubt in the back of my mind, like, oh, you've got to take this opportunity. But then the other side was saying, oh, you've just been given an opportunity. Like, it doesn't actually mean anything. But I think if I had my time again, I'll go, this is your opportunity. It doesn't matter whether you deserve it or not. You've got it and you've just got to take it. And they're the things you learn as you get older, I suppose. And that's something that we, again, try to teach teach our athletes. Now, I first came across you in a, in a first grade game between Melville and South Perth. And remember being very impressed by the way you played the short ball. Um, and we later played a second living game together, um, which might have been your first second living game. It was certainly my one and only for WA. But two things that come back to my memory um, from that was, one, how nice you are and how down to earth and humble you are. Um, which hasn't changed, but also how good of a fielder you are. Um, and I remember thinking, gee, this bloke's easily one of the best fielders I've, I've seen. W- is that something that's come naturally, or is that something as a kid you spent a lot of time working on? Because I know that there's not really such thing as talent, but some people have, are gifted. You're incredibly quick across the ground. You're powerful. You've got a good arm. Is that something you've worked really hard at? I think subconsciously it always has been, because my hero growing up was John T. Rhodes. So I'd be in the backyard for like my seventh birthday party we'd have a bunch of friends around play a game cricket i wouldn't really battle bowl i was just like be out in the field like trying to take hangers or like trying to make diving stuff so i think it's always been there and i've always just chipped away at it without trying um and it's just sort of slowly transformed into like basically the most important part of my game if i'm if i'm always catching balls it means i'm watching the ball transfers into my into my batting as well so it's always been there i've always chipped away at it but i think subconsciously when I was younger I just kind of did it without realizing that I was all right at it and it just sort of grew into what it is now. Wow that's amazing and is that something you go back to if you think okay I'm not in the best form at the moment you go back and say right I'm going to catch a few more balls or I'm going to make sure my fielding as a base is something I focus you focus on? Yeah this this year has been a tough year shield cricket wise for me and just about every session I'll make sure every time I'm catching the ball, I'm taking that extra half a second to see the seam of the ball when it's coming down at me. Because I always find if I'm catching the ball and I feel really confident catching the ball, because I mean, if you've got a ball coming at your head and you're trying to catch it and you're not watching it, chances are it's going to hit you in the head. So for me, it's a, like it's almost a no-brainer. If I'm watching the ball really well, that's going to transfer straight into my, into my batting. Awesome. And again, another great insight from a top-level cricketer of just doing the basics well, watching the ball. Um, Moving on from that, you, you made your first class debut in January 2013 against New South Wales. How was that experience? It was a, it was a learning experience for the mental side of my game, I think. I sort of went in there really confident, wasn't really that fussed about the bowls that I was coming up against. And I got a duck in my first innings and I wasn't, wasn't that happy about. Um, How would you get out? Got run out, a 27 ball run out duck, I think it was. And as they were bowling to me, I was thinking like, it's not meant to be this hard. I'm making it harder than what it is. And I just kept battling myself mentally. Um, and then I sort of had a good t- chat to JL halfway through and he said, oh, just go out there, relax, watch the ball, don't worry about anything. And I realised that's what my game had always been. And I'd gone away from it just because I was playing my first game for WA and there was all these new bowlers. And all of a sudden, next innings, I got, I think I only got 30 odd, but I got 30 off probably 40 or 50 balls and felt completely different player and got a lot of confidence out of that rather than, worrying about what I'm doing and what the bowl's trying to do and I just got all confused in my own mental state. Yeah, I think it's it's so amazing to hear stories like that where just a, a two minute or a five minute chat with a mentor or someone like JL can really just be the, the spark you need or the little mindset shift you need and so many young players um, focus on going to try and get their technique right when yeah. once you get to a certain level, it's your technique's there, it's just about tweaking and backing yourself and playing your way that's that's got you there so another great little story now 2015 matador cup um you were left out of the wa side um you, luckily there was the um ca11 but how was that sort of after having a couple of years in the wa side and, and feeling a part of it you then were left out of the squad how did that how did you take that i knew it was going to be hard to make the squad because i think the 
the Australian team to Bangladesh got cancelled, so then we, we had all our guns coming back, and I knew it was going to be hard to get a game. So I was disappointed that I didn't make the squad, but at the same time, I knew I had a great opportunity. Um, and I suppose my career was almost at a tipping point there. If I did well on that, I might get a couple, of like a couple more years maybe with WA. So I just saw it in a really positive light. I sort of ignored the fact that I didn't make the WA side because in the end, I'm probably going to play just as many games for CA than if I made the WA team, I might have only played one or two just because we had all the good players back. So for me, I just tried to really yeah focus on that opportunity and just do everything I could to grab that opportunity and not let it slip through my hands. Is that something that comes naturally to you? Do you think like seeing the positive side of the coin or is that something you've been trained and taught or you've developed over, over your, sort of your career and your life? I think going back to Lorne, Lorne Sprigg, he sort of showed me that. I never used to have that. I just kind of used to take things as they came, whether it was positive, negative or, or neutral. And I think he really showed me how to focus on positives when positives are there. Because I think a lot of the time, if you've got a negative in front of you, with an equal positive, a lot of people start to really dwell and that negative seems to grow bigger and bigger. Um, so I think he taught me how to focus on those positives and, and not really worry about the negatives because they're there, but a lot of the time they're out of your control and there's nothing you can do about them. So for me, that was a perfect case of that. There's nothing I can change to get into the squad. So I just sort of thought, you know what, bugger it. I'm just going to put all my energy into the CA11 and try and really, really do well there. Amazing, yeah. Whatever you whatever you give your energy to, it, it grows. So if you feed the negative, it'll grow. And if you feed the positive, it'll exactly. grow. So you then went on, as you say, tipping point. You went on, dominated that tournament. Uh, I think you got a 99 run out and then smacked a few more good scores. And then back into the WA Shield side, average 67, got your first, uh, average 67 for the season, got your first um, first class 100. What changed for you during that time? And what, looking back, um, were you doing really well at that point of your, your career? I think through the CA11, it, it literally just gave me, when I made that 99, it just gave me that confidence that it doesn't matter who you're playing against, whether it's your club side or whether it's, uh, whether it's for your state side, whoever it's against, whatever you've done and you've been picked in a team for, it's going to be good enough. And I think that just gave me the belief that it didn't matter that I was playing for CA, I can still perform well against the state side so I took that back into the into the Warriors team when I got got the call up back into the shield side and just thought I'm just going to use all that confidence I know my game can, can make runs and I'm just going to make sure that I'm going to make runs now because this is whenever you walk out in the field that's your chance to make runs because as JL always says it you can't make runs in the change room and as cliche as that is it's spot on so I just thought all I'm going to do is, my, I know my game plan, I'm going to stick to my game plan, I'm going to make sure my game plan works because I've seen it work before. Awesome. And I've just picked out a little quote from an article around that time. Um, you said, I feel like my game hasn't changed much between last season and the ones prior. Everything just gelled together without me having to over, try to overthink many things. Things completely clicked in my game. Like, can you just expand on that a bit for our, for our viewers and listeners? Because I think... Uh, Whitey spoke about not, list, not, not overthinking. I know I've read a lot of it from Bancroft and it's something for, in my game. What did you mean there and what do you mean when you talk about sort of overthinking? A lot of the time when you're, when you're sort of coming up against an opposition, you can always get caught up in what they're trying to do to you and, and how they're trying to, like obviously having three slips in the gully or whatever, but they might change the field and, and start manipulating the way you play and they want you to manipulate that. And I think... When I played in those CA11 games, I just started going, I'm just going to literally see the ball, hit the ball. No matter if there's a fielder there, I'll just beat the fielder or I'll hit along the ground past the fielder. So I think a lot of guys, I think a lot of cricketers get caught up in thinking too much. But all I tried to do was just go see ball, hit ball. And if things happen out of my control, things happen out of my control. I think that's a really important lesson for a lot of kids to not focus on a lot of externals that are going on around them. Because as soon as you do that, you start focusing on what they're doing and you put less focus on what you're doing. And that starts, that slowly has a detrimental effect on your own game. Yeah, awesome insight. Now, moving forward again, f almost to the day, just a couple of weeks difference, but four years after your first class debut, you made your Australian test debut. Um, what was, how, how did you first of all find out you'd been picked in the test squad? So we had a, we had an, uh, I was just about to go out for a practice game for the Scorchers. Um, just like out at Murdoch Oval, I think it was. Um, and I was getting my ankle taped and I wasn't meant to have my phone on me at the time, but it started vibrating. I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. 
So I got my phone out of my pocket and it had Trevor Holmes, who's the chairman of Slick. And I was like, what's going on here? Like, I was really rattled for a second. And because I was getting my ankle tapped, I didn't want to answer the phone. And I was like, I just got up off the table and the physio was halfway through strapping my ankle. And I was like, sorry, mate, I'll be back in a sec. So I took the call and I had like this big bit of tape like waddling <laughs> around down the stairs. Um, and then, yeah, he told me I was in the test squad and I just sort of, like a lot of guys say it, but I was genuinely speechless for a couple of seconds. I didn't know what to ask next. It's not that I was, oh, sorry, it's not that I was speechless. I just didn't know what to ask after he told me that I'd been included in the test squad. And I was just thinking, really? <laughs> so yeah, it was just an awesome feeling. Awesome. And then did you, just going deeper into that, did you call people straight away and tell them or did you get your ankle straight, strapped and go straight out to the field and tell all the boys? Or how, how did you then the next... 15, 20 minutes. I ripped the tape off, didn't finish my ankle tape, put my socks on, like just, I didn't call anyone, just ran straight downstairs to where the team huddle was because I was late for that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to call Barash for being late from jail. And I like, kind of like snuck into the huddle. And he was like, Hilts, get in the middle. And I was like, oh, no. And then he just like gave me like a big high five and a big hug and then told everyone the news. And I, so he was already aware you were in? Yeah, he'd, he'd already been told. And then like my mum, dad, and the rest, like missus and all the family and stuff, they found out through the news and they were spewing that I didn't tell them because I was like halfway through a practice game you and as I field. finished, went to message and they're like, oh, apparently <laughs> you're in the test one. I was like, sorry. I, like, Been playing. Play. Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Now, you then made your test debut in Sydney at the Sydney test. Um, what was it like walking out to bat for the first time? And you, you've batted first in that game, so you hadn't been on the field at all. And obviously you came in after Renshaw had scored 100 and the team was doing well. But that moment walking out onto the ground, what was that like? I actually felt really a lot calmer than I thought I would. I thought I was going to walk out there really quickly, like as you do if you're a bit nervous, really jittery. But I walked out and because Matt Renshaw was getting applauded for, I think about 180 something in his fourth, third test, I think. Because that happened, I was just thinking like, oh, all the focus is on him and no one's focusing on me. This is perfect. I can just sneak out there without anyone realising. And I just sort of, it literally, it just felt all natural. I was obviously looking around in a bit of, in a bit of awe. Um, but once I marked centre and then sort of looked down the wicket to see like Muhammad Asif about to start running in, I was thinking like, this is it. This is like, this is happening. And that's when, which is really bad because the ball is running in at me and I'm, got all these emotions flying thinking like I'm about to face up for Australia and then it just I had this flood of emotion and I'm glad he bowled me a half volley not like a beautiful length ball outside off because I probably would have like thrown the sink at it and nicked it but thankfully he bowled me a slot ball and I could smack it for four and then after that I was good. So first ball went for four? Yeah first ball went for four but I was just thinking as he was running in I was like you should pull out don't face up don't face up don't face up bang. <laughs> yeah so I was I was really rattled as he was running in but then after that ball it just had like this gush of emotion just released and I, I felt good after that. Wow, that's uh, such a great insight and again shows that the best players are human beings. I think as as kids growing up you probably had the same thing, you see, you see your heroes, you see them on TV and you sort of idolise them and, you, you, and especially when they do so well you, you sort of forget that they're human beings sometimes. So it's it's great to remind everyone that you go through the same things that, that 10 year olds or first graders go through at, at the top level. So. After that, you were then left out of the Australian squad uh, when they went to India. How was, how was that? I remember reading that you, what you said in the media and that you hadn't played in India and you understood it, but there must have been some sort of disappointment. You'd had a taste and that was then taken away from you? I was disappointed, but at the same time, because the, um, yeah, the selection was for, for India and, and Mitch was going and he's had a lot of experience and exposure over there, I actually wasn't... I thought I'd be a lot more... Um, gutted than what I was because I'd had the taste and it had all gone really relatively smoothly so I felt pretty confident that it wasn't the end of the world for my international career so I just sort of put all my focus into Shield Creek and just thought oh like I'm just going to go back to Shield Creek and try to make as many runs as I can and that I sort of almost forgot about it and I was watching the tests at home and I never really thought like oh you could be there so which is really weird because I thought I would be if if I was to say that <clears throat> to myself in the future, like, oh, you won't be disappointed for missing out on an Australian tour. I'd think, like, that's, that's stupid talk. Yeah, but I was actually quite happy. Well, not, not happy is a bad word, but I was at ease that 
I didn't get selected and I could just go and do my own thing in shield cricket. That sounds like it's that sort of positive, see, the, yeah. whatever the situation in the best light possible mindset that you've, you've, we've spoken about. Now, um, I just want to get into your sort of your mindset, habits and routines a little bit more now. Um, have you done any form of sort of mental conditioning over the years, meditation or visualization or anything like that to help with your mindset? The biggest thing I've done, I, I tried meditation, but it didn't, I couldn't quite grasp the concept of it. Um, the biggest thing that's worked for me is visualization. So before every game, I'll always use my visualization. So I write, I've, got, I've got a little diary that I write my notes in of all the bowls and I'll sit there before bed, whether it's in the lounge room, and I'll, I'll, I'll literally, as, as it is, visualize the bowls running in, what they're gonna try to do to me and what my game plan is to attack that. And that's one thing I learned from my debut that I need to build that strength up. And it probably took a good 18 months to two years to do that. And then once that, sort of was set in stone, my technique felt really good, that's when things started to really flow on and, and, and really click. And just to be clear, is that you picturing them running in out of your own eyes? It's not sort of looking in as if you're watching TV, it's you? I'll do both. So I'll, I'll sit there and imagine the scene of we're batting first on a day one wicket and I know where the change rooms are and I'll sort of image myself sitting in the change rooms and I'm batting and I'll like see the guys running in for a couple of balls and then I'll like transfer myself into me batting and have that feeling of like a, a, a Frankie Worrell running into bowl to me or like a Joe Manny or, or someone that's bowling at me and really sort of feel that emotion and, and feel the, the wind blowing in your hair and that sort of stuff. Awesome, and is that something that took you a while to get good at? Yeah, it, it took me took me probably six to eight months to understand how to like get to that state of like the proper, because when you start doing, you think you're doing it really well until you do it a little bit better one more time and it slowly builds and builds and builds. And now I literally feel, if I'm sitting with my eyes closed, it's as if I'm literally in the moment, I can like hear birds in the background and I feel like I'm actually there. Whereas at the start, I could sort of picture the stick man running in with the ball coming out and I would play it or whatever. So I think it took me six to eight months to really get it good. Um, and I, from then I've just been trying to keep it at, at a good level and, and get it better. That's amazing because I think a lot of people get um, impatient with their mental skills and they, they are skills that you need to practice and develop and a lot of people try meditation or visualization and it doesn't work after yeah. a week and they give up whereas you, nobody learns to play a good cover drive in a week it's the same mm -hmm. sort of process and so that's again a great insight to hear how you just stuck with it and then now it's something that is really vivid and really real and that's something we like to encourage our players our athletes to do is, is picture yourself in that moment before it actually happens so Great to hear that. I think a really important part with visualization, if you're struggling to grasp the concept of it, we always get told um, by our, our psychologists is, imagine like your best innings you've ever had and whatever your favorite shot is or when, if you played one really good cover drive once, try and imagine yourself back in that moment because that's a real feeling that you had rather than trying to, if you can't create the feeling, imagine the feeling that you had previously and help that go forward. Because that, that's what really helped me was, I had a really good innings for South Perth and I played some beautiful cover drives and I used that as my sort of blueprint on the feeling I should get when I'm doing my visualization. And then you transfer that feeling into a different scenario or situation yeah. where you're at the um, Adelaide yeah, yeah, Oval yeah. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. awesome, awesome. Now, as far as a pre-ball routine goes, something that I'm big on and I think most good players have is some sort of mental pre-ball routine, whether it's a mantra, they say to themselves, win this ball, watch the ball, whatever. and what you do as soon as the ball's finished to switch off and then switch back on. How do you go about that? I've got a very, pretty, oh, pretty specific routine. So before every ball, I'll either talk to the bloke at the other end or um, just set myself play straight. Because if I play straight, it takes out bold LBW. If you can't play it straight and the ball's wide off, you're naturally gonna leave it because you're not gonna be able to cover drive it because that's not straight. So that's my general mental focus is just play straight and see the ball. That, that just happens naturally. And then I sort of, after every ball, if I block it, leave it, hit a four, whatever it is, I'll, I'll scratch center once, I'll walk off, I'll do like a little circle around where the crease line is. I'll tap two spots once and then a third spot three times. And then I'll go back, fiddle around, push my helmet down like that, then fix my grill and then face up. That's and is, is that time. conscious or is that now yeah. become, so you're consciously ticking off one, yep. two, three, Touch, 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 touch. Like just fiddle around, yeah. make myself feel comfortable, maybe fiddle with my gloves. 
squish my helmet down and then like fiddle with my grill or, or fiddle with my like the peak of my grill and then face up again. And is there a, then a mental phrase, mantra saying or something that you, you say as the bowler's running in? As I'm doing that, all I'm thinking is just play, play straight. straight. Yeah. yeah. Like as, as I walk back into my crease line, once I've fiddled with my helmet, I think play straight and then I face up and go again. Yeah, that reminds me of my old housemate, Middlesex teammate, John Simpson, who used to grab his grill and that was his like switch on moment, sort of mm. every ball, which is, uh, is interesting. Now, something that's really common when in my coaching sessions with young players is them dealing with mistakes. They get frustrated and annoyed and I've, I've seen that right through the levels, even in first class professional career. How have you sort of learnt to deal with mistakes and move on both in the moment um, and sort of ongoing, say, mistakes that you may be continue, continuing to make? I think I used to get really caught up in like a play and miss. I'd get really angry with myself and it was detrimental to my game because I was constantly thinking about things that had happened in the past and my focus wasn't on the in the moment decisions that I had to make when I was batting. So. I had a chat to our old psychologist and he said, oh, just every time you play and miss, just try and smile or, or like giggle a little bit. And I thought it was really dumb. I was like, that's so lame. Imagine like a bloke playing and missing and then you look over and he's like, give himself a little chuckle. But to his credit, I sort of took it into a South Perth game and at first I would like play and miss at one and like try and fake a giggle, giggle and it didn't work. And then I f tried to fake a laugh and it didn't work. And then I just like smiled and like did a bit of a shrug. And I was like, oh yeah, I actually feel better now. So, to his credit, it actually worked really well. Um, as for going like ongoing mistakes, it's a hard thing if you're constantly making the same mistake. You, my view is you've got to try not to look too far into it because as soon if you're making the same mistake over and over again, you're always trying to find so many solutions rather than trusting. Because unless it's been a mistake you've been making since you were this high. I don't reckon there's much wrong with it. It's just that you're doing it more consistently now. So I think you've just got to trust your game and know that whatever you've done leading up to this point, it's not going to continue happening. You've got to trust your game plan that it's going to turn eventually. And as soon as you do that, you'll relax a little bit, you'll stop tensing up, and all of a sudden, more than likely, that mistake is going to start happening less and less or at all. Now, you've probably covered this in some of the other things, but how do you deal with periods where, you've, where you're not scoring as many runs as you like or you're out of form, um, especially in the sort of the public eye where the, the media sort of say he's not scoring runs or he's only averaging 15 or something. How do you deal with that? Did you get those stats, 15? <laughs> <laughs> um, I learnt a lot about that this year. Uh, I struggled quite a bit through the Shield season, first half especially of the Shield season. Um, and I think after I've had about 100 chats with JL, 5,500 batting theories and literally what it came down to was I didn't really make any runs through the whole season and I got a, I got a few in the last game and the only thing I changed was I wasn't watching the ball hard enough and then as soon as I did that in the nets, the bowlers didn't seem as fast, the spinners seemed to lob them up more often than not so it sounds really basic but as soon, whenever I'm, I've written notes in my little diary to myself, every time I'm going to, if I start struggling with form all I've got to think of is watching the ball because if you're not watching the ball, mate, you're going to struggle. And I think a lot of people, if they're going through bad form slumps, if they keep getting hit on the pad, they think, oh, my front foot's getting too far out. So they focus on that rather than start focusing on the ball coming down at them and hitting them on the pad. So yeah. I think that's the most important part. And if you're watching the ball really well, chances are it's going to eliminate it. I think that's really interesting. I'd maybe like to go a bit deeper into that because... I heard um, someone somewhere say that Paddy Upton, or maybe I read it, Paddy Upton spent eight hours working with Jacques Callas at one point about watching the ball and what that actually means. Because obviously as cricketers, we watch the ball. We don't, we don't have our eyes closed. We watch the ball. But it sounds like what you're saying there is you're getting your focus in the right place, not on technique or head or you're, you're actually just trying to focus again on seeing the ball and making a decision yeah exactly right and I think when you're in a game context it's it's a competition between bat and ball no matter how many hours you put in in the nets prior to that doesn't matter how many balls you faced literally all that matters you're, you're like your game is not going to change from the net session yesterday to the morning of day one so I think the biggest thing you got to focus on is the the competitiveness between the bowler coming in at you and you facing that ball that he's trying to get you out with. 
if you're focusing on that, not focusing on, oh, yesterday my cover drives, they, they weren't quite right, or my back foot's not going far enough back or across or whatever it is, at the end of the day, if, if you make an, an ugly 100, it's still a 100. If you make a, a beautiful 30, like you've creamed every single shot, it's only 30, it's not a 100. So I think that's a big lesson I wish I could learn when I was younger was you don't have to look pretty all the time. Once you're in a game, runs are runs. It doesn't matter whether you make them well, whether you make them badly. They're still there in the newspaper the next day. So I think if you're focusing on technique whilst you're batting, it's going to be really hard to move on from if you did make a mistake the ball before. Yeah, and I'd like to hear if you've got an example of this, but something I talk to my athletes about is becoming comfortable and at ease with batting at 80 or 85% of your best because you're not always going to feel your best. And like you say, an ugly 100 or an, like an ugly 80 in tough conditions um, often wins games, but that's often when you're at 80 or 90% of your best, you're not at your best. Often when you're at your absolute best, you're feeling good, you make a good 20 or a good 30 and then get out. Yeah. Have you got quite an example or a few examples of that? My, probably my second most recent innings, the first innings against South Australia, I'd come off probably four scores of less than 20 or probably, probably six scores of less than 20. Like I was struggling, wasn't... Felt really good in the nets, like a lot of people do, but I just couldn't convert it into the into the real games. And anyway, I just I looked, I went out there and I just thought, bugger, like I'm just gonna do anything, no matter what it ha- what happens. I'm just gonna try and make runs, whether it's 100 through third man past the slips. I don't care what happens. And sure enough, I think my first three scoring shots were behind point on the offside. Whether they were edges or not, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> And I thought, oh, like, I'm on... Guiding them down there. I ended up being like 15 after my first like 10 balls. I was thinking like, oh, how good is this? Like I'm getting a little bit of momentum. And we like, glanced one just past the keeper down leg side twice in three overs. So I was on about 24 or 25 and they've all been behind the wicket. And I was just thinking like, this is an absolute rabble. Like I can't score in front of the wicket. And I've sort of, I caught myself out then, like what you said, it doesn't matter how, doesn't matter how you make them. If you're making runs, that's just that's all you need to worry about. And from then on, it made me click and not worry about what I was looking like to the opposition or the crowd or my teammates. And I just started like almost accepted that I looked bad and just started like noodling them around and looked ugly. But then I, I got to 50 and I was I was really happy that I'd like fought through that tough period and ended up getting a bit of reward. And then yeah, 100 in the second innings. Yeah. So yeah, it's so important to to just not judge yourself for that. I think too many people go, I'm not at my best, I'm just gonna throw it away, yeah. or people are judging me, I'm not playing well. But if you can become comfortable batting at 80% or 85%, it's still not as far off your best as you often think. Yeah, exactly, and I think when you, even if you're not, if you're not batting your best, it doesn't mean you can't make runs as well. If you're, if you're batting at 60%, you can still have that day where things just might go a little bit your way, or you just, fight your ass off and then next thing you know you're on 70 or 80 and you've had a you've had a good day and something clicks and you, you then start to feel good and get close now yeah. um what's your preparation like um leading into any sort of match obviously it varies 2020 four day grade game but what generally is your preparation a few days out morning of etc skills wise i try not to change anything whether it's t20 one day cricket or four day cricket i try to just have a pretty calm net I'll probably get someone on a on a give me some throwdowns and I'll try and hit a few sixes straight down the ground because I don't want to I don't want to mix my game up too much and play heaps of lap sweeps because that's not really my game. So I try and keep it really simple and basic skills wise. As to do with everything else, I I just kind of take it as it goes. I'll go to bed at a pretty similar time. I don't have like any uh, any spe- special meals I have to have or anything. I, the only thing I do is mentally is the night before I'll I'll write down what bowlers I'm going to come up against, what I think they'll try to do to me and what I'll do to sort of counter their plan. So if I've got a guy who's in a forwarder game, if he's bowling out swingers, I'll say, oh, if I play nice and straight, every ball that's on the stumps, I'm going to play it nice and straight. As soon as it starts outside off stump, it's just going to keep swinging away and I can't play that straight. So that just makes my game plan really simple. And if it's for T20s, I just sort of go through what, what guys have got what slow balls and, and how to pick them up and if they've got an out the back of the hand slow ball, I know that's their danger ball or that's their ball I've got to score off. So I just try and really knuckle down the ways. I'm going to score the next day. And then when that opportunity comes up, I've already mentally planned it and it just sort of happens a lot faster than if you see a bloke bowling out the back of the hand slow ball that you've never seen before and all of a sudden you're like, oh, what do I do with that? So 
So I think it's really good for your preparation. Awesome. And is that something you just started doing yourself? Because that's amazing you say that. That's exactly what Vogue, you said he did in his um, preparation the night before a game. And obviously he was your WA captain for a lot of your career. Yeah, so I, I did it on and off for probably a couple of years. Um, did it for some games, then I wouldn't make any runs. And I was like, oh, it doesn't work. Almost like the, meta, the visualization thing. I didn't really quite buy into how that preparation helps me. And then a couple of games in a row, I made some runs. So I was thinking, oh, there's a bit in this. So I was just doing a bit more. Um, and then Vogsy was averaging about 90 in test cricket and he came out and to the boys and said like, oh, this is what I do. And I was like, if he can average 90 in test cricket, I'm doing it as well. Good and from then on, I've basically, for the last two years, I've done it religiously every night before a game. Yeah, awesome. Now, just on game day, do you, is there anything you do specifically? Do you sort of try and pack all your stuff the night before? Are you quite organised? Do you just scramble and you can like Colt spoke about he always likes to be the first one at the ground have a coffee read the paper and relax is there anything in particular for you I might, uh, I might throw Colt's off next time and get there real early <laughs> uh, no there's nothing I, li I like getting there relatively early just because I don't like being getting to the ground like chuck my stuff on stuff on putting sunscreen on running out I don't like being rushed I'll get there with just like half an hour before before the toss or whatever just sit there have a coffee just chat to the guys, throw a bit of band around, but nothing really that I've, I'd say, I just like getting there early and not being rushed is the main one. Yep, cool. Now, um, you've played with and against, the question ask everyone, some of the um, world's best players. Um, what's a common theme or traits you've, you've noticed in these sort of um, high el elite, elite players? I think, aside from how hard they all really work and um, the hours they put into their game, I think the biggest thing is they just know what their game plan is and they know how to do it well. So someone like Simon Cash has got a much different technique, but everyone sort of said when he started playing T20 cricket that he's going to be a useless T20 cricketer, but really he was one of our best T20 cricketers for a couple of years. That He would make sort of 30 to 40 runs every game and get us into winning positions just because he knew how he was going to make runs. It might be a little bit different to the norm of a, a classical batsman or a Chris Lynn or something like that, but... He knew how to make runs, and he just stuck by his plan, trusted his plan, and knew that his plan was going to work. Yeah, awesome, awesome, great insight. Now, personally, how do you switch off and get away from cricket? Uh, I'll either jump on the PlayStation, or I'll go for a surf if there's a bit, bit of swell around. So that, that, if there's swell around, that's pretty much my number one go-to on the winds, all right, just because it's just fun getting out there, take a couple of guys from cricket, from the Wacker also surf as well, which is handy so you can go at them. It's just it's just good fun. It's, it's like being around your mates when you're out in the water and it's yeah, good fun catching. Great way to mates. switch off. And do you, ha do you have any sort of daily habits or routines? Do you sort of get up and, and do your uh, some sort of conditioning or reading or anything like that or not really? Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll take the dog for a walk and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Make a coffee first thing when I wake up. I don't know if that's a routine or a habit. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I've seen uh, big Simon Mackin walking the dog down here at South Perth for yeah. sure a few times. So he's, you, he's living around the corner now. Yeah, so you dog walkers, must be something in that. Now, just before we wrap up, what does the, uh, the off-season hold for you now? Uh, so the off-season for me, I'm going to go down to Bremer Bay, down near Albany there for, for the Easter weekend. Um, and then I get back and go on a holiday with the missus for two and a half weeks to Hawaii. So, Surf's up. Sur surf's going to be there, yeah, can't Infinity. wait. She's going to join along as well there. She enjoys the, the more casual wave, so Lovely. To it. And after that, we, when will you get back into cricket? And Is there any, any sort of um, tours or, or trips away planned, or are you not sure yet? For me, I'm just going to be, I'm looking forward to it. Last couple of pre-seasons, I've been away from home, uh, been overseas or, or over east, so I'm looking forward to just... Being in Perth, just being independent, can go grab a coffee with anyone ever they need, so go catch up with the mates when I want. Um, I'm just looking forward to just being in my own space for, for more than two months. It's going to be good. Awesome, awesome. Now, a couple of final questions. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Is there something that comes to mind? You probably hear a lot of cricketers say it, but watch the ball. That's probably for me, and I'm sure a lot of cricketers can speak on that behalf, but yeah really watch, see the seam, if you, if you think you're watching the ball, see if you can pick up the seam, because if you can pick up the seam, then you know you're watching the ball. Yeah, awesome. And what's your definition of success? Ooh, that's a... This one stumps the boys all yeah, the time. Yeah, that's a curly one. Um, 
I think success is is very individual. If you're happy with where your career or, or life is going and you had goals to aspire to reach that level, I think you can classify yourself as successful. Awesome. That's awesome. Love that answer. And finally, why do you play cricket? It's just good fun with your mates, especially if you win. Winning with your mates, is that's why I play. Winning yeah. with your mates. Yeah. Awesome. Not, not much beats winning. Awesome. Now, Hiltz, if um, our viewers or listeners want to follow you, what's is there a way, is there social media or something they can follow you and, and connect with you? There is, but you put me I can't think of my social media. I think it's at... Hilton149, maybe? Hilton C149, Twitter. Okay. And then I reckon it's Hcartwright149. Instagram. On, on the gram. All right, well, we'll get the links to that yeah. done. But Hilts, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for sharing so many great stories. And uh, I'm sure our viewers and listeners have got a huge amount of insight from you there. Thanks, mate. Thanks a lot for having me. It's no worries. Pleasure. Cheers.